I'd like to thank my patrons for making this video possible, especially David Gold, who, no kidding, I saw him nail a moose from 50 meters away. It was the most incredible shot anyone's ever taken. But then he turned to me with tears in his eyes and he said, he doesn't like to hurt animals. And then he walked over to the moose and he laid hands on it and it came back to life. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. I think about it every day. All right, we are drawing Satine Zilla's Roman's photo reference pack from ArtStation. It's probably available other places, but I grabbed it on ArtStation. Uh, the link will be in the description if you want to draw some stuff like this. And let's do it. So why am I drawing Romans, Roman centurions from reference? Uh, well, the obvious answer, number one, is I need to get better. I need to get way better at drawing, like much, much, much better. I am nowhere near where I need to be and what I want to be able to do. So I just got to practice, practice, practice. And with this kind of stuff, that is priority number one. So it doesn't really matter what I draw. I could really be drawing anything as long as I'm drawing something that has some sort of objective criteria for me to push against, right? In this case, it's there is a reference, there is a photograph. Does it look like the parts of the reference that you are trying to nail? And that's it. And then two, why that particular subject matter? Uh, because I was just in Italy and I saw this reference pack and I was like, you know what? That would be an interesting way to keep my mind on the inspirations that I found on my vacation because I am trying to pay those inspirations forward into a project and to make work very directly inspired by that. I'm not interested in just going to a place and then getting inspired and then forgetting about it. I want to take the inspiration and actually make it operative and do something with it and do a project. So I'm not sure if I'm going to release this video before or after the first pandemonium design process videos have gone up. But if you have seen those, then you know what I'm getting at. I'm trying to build out that bigger project. I'm sticking to my Roman and Italian influences. And I, yeah, this reference pack for something when I wanted to draw figures and just practice my line work, it was a dead ringer. I was like, sure, it's a bunch of Romans. Let's do it. It'll keep us in the mindset. It'll keep us thinking about what we're trying to interface with. And maybe it will find its way into the designs for that project. You know, we are getting historically informed. Well, I mean, this reference pack makes no claims to be historically accurate. And my gut says that it's not, but um, it's still the form language, the shapes, the basic cultural influences will perhaps cross pollinate with something else and wind up in one of the designs that we do for that more creative project. Always good. Now, why am I drawing the way that I am drawing? Well, the short answer to that is because of the plethora of indescribable influences that have been driving the nature of my will for my entire life. That's why I'm drawing the way that I am. But the more practical answer to that is um, I'm drawing shape to shape as I'm doing these studies. I'm using fountain pen, which is good for drawing shape to shape, and I'm just drawing directly. So I don't have a sketch underneath or anything like that. And a couple of reasons for that. One is speed. That It does tend to make things go a little bit faster because you're not wringing a lot out of every individual shape. You're just putting it down and then kind of leaving it. But more important than that for me, and the reason that I use this method for studies like this, is that it makes you focus hyper attention on each individual shape. Now, I want a high level of shape attention in this round of practice and study, right? If I wanted a high level of form attention in this study, I wouldn't be using pen, right? I would be using a pencil or I'd paint it in Photoshop or something like that. Something that let, really lets me dive into making things illusionistic and for me. Not, not the easiest thing to do with fountain pen but I knew I wanted shapes. I wanted to understand the graphic breakup of the shapes that these kinds of armors and costumes make before diving into anything like their more three-dimensional form. So use a method that focuses on shapes. Now, it's not like you can't carefully craft shapes with pencil, right? You're supposed to be doing that, quote unquote, but the nature of this medium where it puts down a sharp, 
crisp, rather unvaried line. You know, it has a little bit of thick to thin, but really fountain pen, unless you're pressing very hard, is going to give you just the slightest amount of variety. It really can give you a nice, clean, mechanical line. The good thing about that for this kind of study is that it just forces you moment to moment to be like, am I drawing the right damn shape here? Is this square enough? Is this sharp enough? Is this long enough? Is this short enough? Is Am I, e even when you're putting down the hatching for something like shadows, right? It is begging the question, is the, the patch of hatches going down in the right shape? It really insists upon that from your mind. At least it does for me. So I find it to be a great medium for doing shape focused studies. The directness of it is just turns your mind on. It makes you snap to attention. It makes you really look at the references, I think, and really evaluate point to point what you're doing. Now, I'm I'm not sketching for most of these, I don't think. I don't think I even like use the pen to throw some permanent guidelines, you know, like some overall gesture curves or anything like that, which I do do. I do that all the time when I'm drawing with fountain pen. I just didn't do it this time. But you should feel free to do it. One of the best trainings for drawing with pen, drawing with ink, is to just sketch with it the way you would sketch with a pencil. Like resist, at least for the training period while you're practicing with it, resist the idea that you are supposed to be putting down the final surface, that you are supposed to be putting down the last lines that are gonna go down for this thing. That may be true, you're not gonna be able to erase the ink lines, but pretend it's not. Put yourself in a, in a delusional state where you're like, no, it's perfectly fine to sketch with this as if it was a 4H almost invisible graphite pencil. And that will free up your hand, that will let you throw lines more comfortably, that will let you find structure in the sketch because you're gonna draw through things and feel around for the dimensional forms. <sighs> I hope nobody's dead. So feel free to do that. Feel free to just sketch with ink like it was any other very flexible medium. Don't let your mindset change. Just construct and use structure and guess and make messy lines and just let yourself be free with it. That is totally cool. I do that a lot. But the way that I'm drawing right now is more the shape to shape method. That's how I'm getting to all of these drawings. So what do I mean by that? I mean, every shape that I put down, the only evaluation I have, since I have no pencil sketch or anything like that, is is this shape in the reference longer or shorter than the last shape that I drew? And then how much longer or shorter is it? And then I just try to get that proportion correct in my pen drawing. And the truth is that you're not going to, right? You're, you're, the odds that you will actually nail that over and over and over again are very low. But like I said, the fiery attention that that puts on the variety of shapes, the proportional differences between shapes is very useful. Very useful for inscribing the shapes into your memory. And perhaps more important than that is just really seeing them, right? Our brain does this thing while we draw where instead of directly grasping the actual nature of what is in the reference, your brain is doing what it does for everything in your life, what it is accustomed to doing, which is it creates a model of them. It looks at it and your brain sees what the shape really is, right? It just doesn't give you the conscious part of you, the you that you identify as yourself. It doesn't give that part of you access to the raw material. The bigger you, your whole brain, whatever your whole personage does, it says, all right, conscious Steven, he's a bit of a, he's a bit of a simpleton, all right? If you give him the entire psychedelic trip of what the field of view actually contains, he's gonna have a total breakdown or he won't draw anything. He'll just go stare at trees in undying ecstasy for four hours. So we've got to instead offer him a cartoon, a embarrassing simplification of what the world actually looks like. And this is what you interact with most of the time. 
when you are looking at your references and drawing, right? This is at its extreme, this is how children look at the visual complexity of their parents. And then when they go to draw it, they draw the round head and the columns for arms. It's because they're 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 not even grokking that they're off, right? They're just representing their mental model um quite directly and somewhat perfectly, right? It's like Heads are round. They're round-ish. They feel round. Here is a ball. Here is a round head. Um, and in classic drawing parlance, this is called symbol drawing, right? So you go to draw an eye, but you just draw this weird Egyptian hieroglyphic that really looks nothing like what a real eye looks like, especially considering that there is no real thing that an eye looks like. They always look different depending on each person and every individual view, but that's a whole nother can of worms. Symbol drawing, which infects everybody at the beginning of trying to draw, let's say, visually, more realistically, representationally. Uh, and let's be clear here, all good drawing is a mix of both, I would say. It's some delicious balance of representational naturalistic drawing and symbol drawing. But the symbol drawing usually drives the show at the beginning. And this is something that you need to break down through careful attention, through meditating on the actual nature of visual phenomena and the way that they present themselves to either your eye or the camera. There's really no way around it. If you are the kind of artist who wants to incorporate at all some of what the world really looks like, the gorgeous shapes that you see out in the world on figures and trees and lizards and tax documents, you're going to have to at some point have a direct collision with what shapes make that look like that. There's no way around it. You can trace them, you can put them in Photoshop and fill them in with colors to really show to your eye like that thing that you think is a ball or a pipe or something like that is actually this hyper specific contrast filled information filled piece of filigree and that goes for the overall silhouettes of things and it goes for the shapes inside of those silhouettes of things. It goes infinitely deep actually. It actually does go infinitely deep. The whole world is some sort of tragically beautiful fractal where at any level of magnification the entire universe just re-unfolds at that scale. Um, we're talking about drawing, right? I think so. Crap. Um, so fountain pen is a great way to interact with the nature of shapes because as I said, it just forces you to buckle down, right? You don't have to trace anything in Photoshop. You don't have to fill anything in. Just the intensity of the struggle to go put down a shape and then go a millimeter to the right and do the next shape and then go a centimeter to the right and do the next shape after that and compare them between each other. The intensity of that exercise is enough that it makes you really look at the reference and say to yourself, all right, this one's a little bit more square. All right, this is a curve, but it's not just my mental model of a curve, it's, it's this curved. It's either slightly curved or intensely curved, or maybe it's like a, like a Nike swoosh kind of a thing where it is curved, but it has a very specific peak. And if the peak of that curve is not in the right place, it's not gonna look like that curve. Uh, transportation designers call that little peak the drive, the drive of a curve. So there's tons and tons of specificity. Actually, forget tons and tons, there is a perfect amount of specificity to shape, right? Now that doesn't mean that you need to, your goal needs to be represent those shapes exactly, right? That doesn't mean your goal needs to be draw those shapes with such accuracy that it's essentially as if you had projected them onto the piece of paper and trace them one for one. That doesn't need to be the goal. You don't need to be a photograph. You don't need to be a copy machine. But I, I think more what you're trying to get there is the nature of the shapes, right? They don't need to be spot on. They don't need to be perfect. And they certainly don't need to be in perfect proportion to each other, relative to each other. But it's that relative nature. Like I said, it's... When I look at the reference, this shape looks <laughs> arbitrary, but that much rounder than this other shape, right? This shape looks 30% rounder than this shape. How do I capture that 30% increase in roundness 
in my drawing, right? So if the other shape, the shape that it is 30% rounder than is already exaggerated on its own, then that means that that 30% rounder is going to scale relatively, right? And then that opens the doors to style and exaggeration and pushing things. Those are the basic building blocks of that endeavor. So in this drawing, the only bit of good planning that I did in this shape to shape was that I did the hand and the sword first. And that's just because that sword cuts across such a variety of the shapes. You know, it cuts across the sleeve, it interrupts all of these rectangular shapes of the armor, uh, it goes over that strap, it crosses the shield. It really gets in the way of everything. So if I had started with what I normally would like to start with, the face or the head, uh, I would have very quickly probably edited out the sword in my eye and just drawn that stuff. And then when I got to the hand, I'd be like, oh crap, I forgot to overlap the sword and make it cut in front of everything else. So that was one bit of good foreplanning there that is only the result of uh, many, many failures, many years of making that exact mistake. It is amazing. If you, if you have any experience drawing things from reference that have a lot of overlaps, um, even just the nude figure, but especially in costume drawing, I'm sure you have experienced that your brain the, the model is holding a staff or a weapon or there's some big thing that cuts across their chest or a piece of fabric that goes all the way from their shoulder all the way down to the ground, whatever it is. If you don't draw it in in the first like 10 minutes, your brain does the model thing. It generates the model and it edits it out. And you'll get like 40 minutes into the drawing and be like, what the, f I didn't, I didn't draw the pole. I, I forgot to, I drew through it. I drew the leg behind it. I drew the arm behind it. I drew the face behind it. And you, it's not, it's not just that you were like avoiding it. It's that you, for real, for like a half hour, you weren't seeing it. You really weren't seeing it. You weren't conscious of it. I'm sure everybody has had this experience. It's just the perfect example of how your mind the way that you're interacting with your visual field is not that you are seeing the actual visuals, right? You are instead interfacing in some sort of weird simulacra sort of way with a generalized version of what you're seeing, a utility filled new object that represents the actual field of vision and it leads to errors, it leads to mistakes. All right, we're 17 minutes in. If you're here, you're in for the long haul, right? Let's answer some questions. I don't get enough time anymore to answer uh, YouTube comment questions. So I'm just gonna scroll through some questions here and give some quick answers. Uh, John Sun asks, what camera did you use overhead? I use the Lumix GH5 for these videos, not the S, not the better S version. I use the standard uh, GH5. And that is because I have always been cursed with buying things that are too expensive because I want my drawings to be presented as nicely as possible. CauseKey06 asked on a video where I do a pencil drawing, why pencil? I see and understand the benefit of using it as an underdrawing or to help plan out what you want without it being permanent. Why pencil? Um, I just love it. I really can't explain it. I. I don't think pencil, there's nothing about any medium that says, oh, this is a non-final medium or this medium is only for planning or sketching. Like that's just cultural nonsense. That's just baggage. Any medium is a finishing medium if you want it to be. It's up to you. The individual artist gets to decide, gets to decide absolutely everything about their practice and the entire history of art gets to be whatever they want within their personal experience, right? You can decide for yourself that the history of art is an intersection of people's creativity with geopolitics and anthropology, which is, you know, that's my viewpoint, like art is always affected by history. Or in your little world, you get to say that the history of art is the history of people being possessed by otherworldly real demons that live on another plane and have been transmitting art into the world through their hands. You get to pick that. It doesn't mean it's true, but if that's how you wanna feel while you sit down and draw, guess what? No one can stop you. And for you, it's right. So yeah, pencil is whatever you want it to be. And to me, it's a finishing medium. And I use it because it really just aligns with my temperament. It really, really does align with my temperament. It makes me, it forces me to slow down, be more thoughtful and to insist on more uh, mindfulness from myself while I work. 
any time that I would want to jump ahead or race or speed things up or cut corners, every time I do that with a pencil, it the whole race car comes undone. All the wheels pop off, I get shot out of the cabin, I skid across the racetrack in my roll cage and everybody in the audience goes, oh, every time that I try to cut a corner with pencil. And uh, I like that, I like that a lot. All right, Pancho Verde says, are you daft? Art is about rhythm. What else is about rhythm and who might study that? Hmm? You'll get better at art if you move rhythmically. Art is about transferring energy. So study Kung Fu and you'll figure it all out. Wherever you're stuck, you make this weird by kind of knowing, but not really. The only versions of you who are capable of achieving and performing great art are all going to be martial artist versions. Get with the prompt. Get with the program and stop bro sciencing things. Jesus H. Now you can get on to better questions like how come no one does Kung Fu? All right, I got nothing to say about that. I just like that a lot. <laughs> Yo Trimp. Yo Trimp? Ya Trimp. Says, I'll start thinking about what I want to draw once I'm good at drawing. God damn. I damn you. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> I swear to God. I'm going to leap through your screen and throttle you. I really mean it. Oh, man. That makes me so angry. All right. This question, I think, is extra relevant for this. Saf1 says, I love art. I love creating. I want to do more, but I'm not at the level necessary yet. But there is one problem. I hate using reference. It's a boring and grueling process. I just want to be able to draw great pictures. All right. We're going to get a little dose of love here and a little dose of um, discipline. You you don't get to just be able to draw great pictures. Nobody does. You don't just get that. Um, and the honest truth is that you probably never will. Just statistically speaking, you, the only life that you can confirm exists in this universe, the only bit of self-experiencing subjectivity that you are aware of, you will probably never make a great picture. And you probably don't have it in you. You probably, statistically speaking, don't have the grit, the dedication, the blind stubbornness, and the ingenuity to ever do it even once in your life. If you keep feeling the way you feel now. If you keep feeling the way you feel now, it is infinitesimally unlikely that you will ever do it. You will die never having done it. Uh, if you're lucky enough to be on your deathbed, it will be one of a long list of regrets that you never made a great picture. And there's no tragedy to that. Zero. It's not good. It's not bad. It has no moral valence. It's not even sad. It's really not. It's just the real nature of how difficult art is. So if me speaking to you that way caused any kind of energetic spike, any kind of emotional rush, maybe something like a bubbling black anger shooting up and down your spine like lightning, you need to change something. All of your pain and your suffering and the feeling that working from reference is grueling and that it's, it, it's getting in the way of you making great pictures, I don't think you understand how true that is. That feeling, that boring, nothing, unimportant feeling that it is difficult to work from reference is what is going to assure that you will never, ever, ever achieve your goal. So what are you going to do about it? You know, like I said, most likely you don't have it. You really don't have it. Most likely you just can't hack it. You're never going to change a thing. The culmination of your artistic experience is going to be uh, suffering over finding it annoying to use reference and you will never make a picture. That's most likely, most likely what will happen. Or you turn it off and you just stop. You just stop that. 
you just realize that feelings of frustration, annoyance, boredom are arbitrary. They have nothing to do with you. Did you pick them? Can you choose them? Did they, did you author them in any real sense? Did you, did you get behind yourself at some point and say, ah, this is the part of my life where I need to author the feeling of being bored by using reference? Did you do that? No. It's a rhetorical question because no one has ever, no one has ever. That's not what the experience of being conscious is, right? The experience of being conscious is just becoming aware of those things over and over and over and un over again in an unbroken sequence until you're dead. That's what it means to be conscious. Everything on top of that we add is a story that we tell ourselves. So are you really going to let your primal urge to be creative and to do things the way that you want to do be utterly controlled and conditioned by a feeling that simply arises unbidden from a mystery behind your eyes? Is that really what, what, what it's going to be for you? Is that really what it's going to be? Are you just going to let that bubble up whenever it wants? Because trust me, it gets to bubble up whenever it wants right? With, with no solid criteria, with no nice pattern, nothing. It just gets to, whoop, I'm here, I'm boredom, and I guess that that's important. I'm boredom, and that means you're bored, and you're experiencing boredom, and you have to do something about it, and says something about you and your values, and whether you're a good person or not, like ad nauseum, this narrative, this story that we tell ourselves about what it means to be a human being. Just cut it off. Just cut it off. This video that I'm doing here, I felt boredom plenty of times while I was doing it. And you know what I did when I felt the boredom? Nothing. I didn't change anything. I just kept drawing. Who cares? Once you've been drawing long enough, you realize that the way you feel while you draw has nothing to do with the drawings. It has nothing to do with the drawings. You can feel horribly depressed and do great drawings and you can feel like you are getting a direct injection of the subjective secret of the universe and make your most mediocre, boring, uninteresting work. They're separate. And then that's why, as we've talked about on this channel, I always advise people to just choose the joy, right? It has nothing to do with the art. So just pick the joy for yourself and let the art run on its own and just do what it needs, right? Get yourself out of it. Just gr gr grab the, the preening part of you, the little goblin that is hunching over your drawing and being like, oh, I can't do it because I'm bored and frustrated and what's this person gonna think about that? Just kill that guy. Just kill him. Who needs him? Do you need him? Is he helpful at all? Do you want anything to do with him? He sucks. He's the worst. And he's been around forever, living rent-free here at the drawing table for years. Like, just kick him out, a victim. He's done. He, he contributed what he had to contribute. Let's do the other thing now. Let's do the other thing now. Let's do the drawing thing. The part where we make the thing that we always told ourselves we wanted to make. Let's actually do that. Let, let, let's get as close as we can to manifesting something that aligns at all with our will. However possible that may be. I just want you to make pictures. I really want you to make pictures. And making pictures is, it's a paradox. It is both the hardest thing in the world to do and the easiest thing in the world to do. And the paradoxical nature of that is what makes it the hardest thing in the world to do. That's what makes it so hard to wrap your head around and grapple with. I just really want you to make pictures, right? I, I can I can hear it coming off of you. Like, if you didn't really wanna make pictures, you wouldn't be frustrated. I know that. I really respect that too. I know that the depth of that feeling is exactly congruent to the depth of your desire to make pictures. I want that for you. I want you to just make the things that you wanna make, right? And I don't care if they're good or bad. 
right? I would prefer you go through the grueling, boring process of drawing with reference and make something bad than not make anything, all right? And no one should care whether they're good or bad. It's That's like the least important part of making art. The most important part of making art is how it affects the artist. The fact that they need to do it, the need, the fact that they feel this desire coursing through them at all times, and that if they don't do it, they get this disgusting art constipation, which is clearly what your very kind comment on that video was. Uh, definitely sounds like serious art constipation. You're like, oh, I want it to come out, but it won't come out. Just stop pushing, man, it's really bad for your butthole to push that hard. Just let it, let it flow out. <laughs> Bing Bong Barry says, the first 20 seconds of this video might be the most cringy thing I've ever heard. I get you, Barry. I don't watch my videos either. All right, so continuing to go shape to shape on all these drawings, poking at things, scrying some lines, dashing around the canvas. I think you get how it works. Do you, do you get how it works? It is really, it is surprisingly simple, um, at least while you're experiencing it. Like when I'm drawing stuff like this, I don't need to think about anything, which is weird. But I know 16 years of practice is all recapitulating itself with every line that goes down. And that's what makes drawing so hard to teach and to learn and to explain, right? I mean, I really, this sketch session, I, I spend most of my time doing this sketch just managing my emotions, just checking in with myself and being like, oh, you want to stop? All right, don't stop. And that's it. And I very rarely find myself thinking about the nature of a line that I'm going to put down or how dark something needs to be or the nature of these shapes. It really does become a rather automatic process at a certain point. But I know that that's hard for a beginner to hear because you just have no reason to believe it, right? Unfortunately. Um, and that's sort of the big obsidian gate that locks so many people out of reaching advanced levels with art is just you have to kind of take it on faith that that happens until you've experienced it unfortunately but uh, it does it happens to everybody it does really happen to everybody if you practice long enough it does just become automatic all of the thinking and the planning and the breath stuck in your throat, baited worry before you throw a line, it all eventually goes away if you let it, right? You could also just, it's separate from the act of drawing, you could also just have a level of anxiety and neuroticism that um, that will always be there when you're sitting there with your own thoughts, but you're just going to accidentally misattribute it to the act of drawing, that's a consideration. But beyond that unfortunate scenario, uh, no, it does. Everything that you practice enough does eventually become very much automatic. And that seems to be the space in which it works best. The lines look better when you get out of your own way. The values look more sublime and happy when you get out of your, the way. Things look more effortless and less, you know, wrung out and wrought the more you get out of your own way. Uh, so it's not the coolest thing about drawing, right? It's really cool for the individual, but it's not the, I know it's not the coolest thing to hear someone like me say, right? To be like, oh yeah, you know, you just sit there and do it and the drawings come out like this. It's like, yes, in this sitting, that is how I experienced it, right? I just pulled up some shots, put on some music, and I really wasn't worried about the drawings very much, but I have worried about drawing and everything about drawing with a uh, incredible amount of intensity uh, since I was about um, 14 years old, so quite a long time. And that that is really what's producing any facility or ability to not let this thing run away from me completely. It's all its all a long-term game. It's all a marathon. It's not really about um, anything. It is, certain things are about what you're doing in the moment, uh, especially when you're in the beginner stage and you're really trying to, every aspect is just this new thing that you really have no idea how to grok it. But that, 
that has to change. That has to change and it will go away. And art is just always try to remember, you know, like everything that you hear online um, about art and how you're supposed to practice and, oh, this is really what happens when you draw and this is what makes you better. It's like, no, no, I hate to say it, but no, that's just, um, that works for our current culture. But uh, people have been drawing great since they were painting on cave walls, right? Like, you've probably never drawn a buffalo as well as one of those buffaloes on the walls of the cave of Lascaux. So you either live your life pretending that's not true, or you look at that and you face the raw fact of that, and you take it, honestly, you take it on face value and you go, right, you don't, you can just learn how to draw. And you, there's no real system that defines what it means to do it well. And there's no solid rules about, no, well, drawing is this kind of brain function. And when you translate things from line to this, it's doing that and that. It's like, that may be true, but it's not helpful. And it's not necessary at all. You don't need to worry about that stuff. So don't get caught up with pedagogy, right? Don't get caught up spending all of your creativity on finding reasons that the way that you are working is the wrong way, right? Stop, oh my God, stop wasting 80% of your creativity for the day on figuring out that, right? Figuring out why you're doing it wrong. Don't do that. Spend your creativity on just trying to make the picture good. Just put it there. And that, that I'm not being facetious, that is actually super hard to do. Um, most artists that I meet who are trying to get better do that. Most of them. I don't think I'm exaggerating. Most of my students certainly do. They spend more of their time worrying about how they're doing it than doing it. And the students who don't have that temperamentally, the students who they they just naturally don't do that. They don't worry, they don't worry about pedagogy. They do spend most of their creativity on just what they're doing, on just working on the picture and trying to give the picture what it needs. They don't really need help. They really don't. They really don't need help. Sometimes they need a little encouragement or motivation or they need one particular technical thing solved or they just have an industry question or something like that. But in the big picture, they don't need help. They just don't need it. They're going to figure it out. And, and, uh, and they, you know, they kind of know it. They, they're the ones who show up to teachers less and take less classes and things like that. And they do great work. Um, now that's nothing to, there's no need to like aspire to that because forcing it doesn't work either. It's just people have different temperaments. Artists have different temperaments. And some people are going to be um, more self-concerned and some people are going to just naturally remember to, oh yeah, it's about the picture. Just try to make the picture better. So think about that. Carry that with you. Investigate your own emotions and how you are dealing with this stuff and see how much of your creativity is really earnestly going towards the work that you make, the kind of work that you make, and how much of your creativity is obsessing over whether you're messing up. Because that's not useful. It's not helpful. And um, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Like I said, I, I know this sounds like a joke, but I'm being for real. I'm really being for real here. Cavemen figured out how to draw. So maybe don't worry about if you're watching the right videos or if your school teaches it right or something. That's crazy, crazy to think about. It is insane to worry about that when the self-evident truth is that people who had to chase uh, chase animals across the savanna for hours to tire them out, to then spear them, um, to drag them back to their cave, uh, they figured out how to draw pretty dang good, probably better than you do. Uh, definitely I've seen stuff they've done that I'm like, damn, I couldn't, I don't think I could draw that. You know, I really, I don't, how do you even get there in your head? And it's pretty well executed and it feels pretty for me. And just the lines are so graceful. Like if that's true, um, you, you gotta rewrite it. You gotta forget everything. You gotta forget all these damn rules and everything that everyone's making up. Like you just gotta, you've got to connect with your content and make some pictures. You really need to, you've got to feel 
for what you're drawing, the way that that caveman felt when he was painting that horse and trancing and going like, please let there be a horse out there on the field today. I fucking love horse meat. Please give me that horse meat. God, send me a horse. My family needs a horse. You got to feel that way about what you're drawing. And then everything else will, it seems, handle itself. You got to be pumped. You really got to, you got to be super pumped. Um, I think about it. I think it's a Frank Frazetta quote. It might be an anachronist. It might be a, um, not an anachronistic. It might be a, what's that damn word for when a story is a, an apocryphal? It might be an apocryphal story about Frank Frazetta, but someone said that they were his biggest fan. And he said something along the lines of, no, you're not. I'm my own biggest fan, right? Like, however excited you are for my pictures, I promise you I'm more excited, right? Um, true or not, uh, I didn't go Google the quote, but ever since I heard that, I remember when I heard that the first time it like I got like a ASMR brain tingles and it rewrote some part of my personality. Something about that struck struck me as deeply true. It just made perfect sense. It was like, right. How the hell is anyone going to feel a big level of excitement for the picture if you didn't feel a big level of excitement for the picture? Like to me, it makes perfect sense that for someone to feel immersed in a drawing that you made, you need to feel immersed in the drawing that you're making. Um, that might be axiomatic. That might be just something that works for me that is true for me. And it might not actually be robustly true, right? Uh, it might not turn out to be robustly true. It might be possible to immerse people in something that you felt utterly disconnected from. But to me, feels true. It really feels true. There's like a deep uh, ideological connection with that idea. And it has worked for me whenever I have tried to put it into practice. And it really did change, change a lot for me. And if you look at Frank Frazetta's pictures, he definitely, the art looks like he's walking that walk, right? Like you, when you read or hear him say that and it, and then you look at his pictures, it sure seems like he was really doing that. You can't fake that. You know, he was, to me, it's clear he was so into it. He was... He was making Frank Frazetta pictures because he needed to see them, you know, like no one else was making them. He had to see them. He had to make them real because his brain was just craving them. And of course, he was super pumped when they were coming out. Damn, art is the best. Art is the best and drawing is the best. I'll just say it. Drawing is the best. Screw everything else. Drawing rocks. Just kidding. Music probably wins. Music has an unfair advantage. I don't know. Something about how music is like completely abstracted is like it really can get into your brain way more directly than anything else. But um, for the sake of being on brand, screw music, drawing's the best. Drawing is the winner. Drawing is the absolute best experience out there. God, I love, oh, getting so pumped thinking about it right now. Oh man, I just got to run out the clock to the end of this video so I could start drawing again. <laughs> just kidding, this is fun. You know, you should, if for any intermediate or advanced artists out there, um, I would highly advise uh, teaching or just keeping a journal and really writing out or saying explicitly your feelings about art because um, over the couple of years that I've been doing this now, it is extremely purifying. It really does sort of saying things out loud and writing them down and teaching others really purifies the experience for myself internally. I find it very psychologically healthy. So um, if you are at a level where you can take on a bit of the questions of others and maybe the emotional turmoil of others. Uh, I find it's extremely rewarding personally, psychologically. It's like if I don't talk to students for a very long time, I find that all the old problems creep in, all the mental stuff that I would uh, help them with. And then something about when they ask me something about that, something about having to hold the truth in my mind for a moment so that I can say it makes it real for me too. Sort of as a, like a little medicinal shot of a, of my, of the more balanced viewpoint that I hope to hold. Um, all right. So we're almost done here. Let me wrap up with some final thoughts about, uh, this kind of drawing, by the way, this is on, on a, in a pretty big sketchbook. Uh, I haven't done a page like this before this large. Uh, I'm always trying to up my scale. You know, I, I used to draw very, very small, and it, it's been a bit of a road for me to slowly draw bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger naturally, right? Without gridding up or anything like that. 
And I would advise that for anyone. It has taught me so much and has made certain aspects of the design principles of scale and proportion much more visceral. And it's made it much more obvious to me how important they are. Just the fact that there's more room for them to branch out. When things are really small, um, the width of a line is enough to change the nature of proportion or scale or detail. And that sort of obfuscates it. When you scale up, it makes the width of a line much less significant. And then you really can sort of fall into the the connections between the different shapes that are bounded by those lines. So I'd, I'd give that a shot if you've ever been interested in it at all. It's been a long road, but it, it feels nice to feel more comfortable drawing bigger freehand. I like it a lot. Um, I'm also, I also wanted to remark here, this is based on a comment I saw someone leave on my sketchbook techniques, portraits and in ink video. Um, I guess I sort of was doing this automatically these days, but this is worth noting, I think. I am composing the page, right? Um, I'm not just doing full top to bottom studies of the photos and sort of just doing them wherever in the sketchbook. That is totally valid, and you should do that, and I have spent years and years doing that, but recently... And when I say recently, I mean probably within the past four-ish years or something like that. I realized that I had leaned too hard into single object thinking, which I would say doing, you know, life drawing style, just let's look at the whole figure top to bottom and just it's it takes up a page or it takes up a random spot on the page. I had leaned too hard into that. I'm naturally inclined to just think in singular object instead of composition, group composition, right? So yeah, like four or three years ago, I just sort of turned a little switch in my brain and I was like, all right, let's just try to compose whenever possible to see if we can start to naturally ingrain some of that in ourselves because I never, I really didn't do it unless I was in this very conscious headspace of I am composing a full picture now or something like that. And then I became aware that people who have a very natural sense of composition are always composing. They're doing it in their sketchbook. They're doing it when they're doing graphic design for their layouts. They're doing it for when they're arranging their desk. They're doing it for everything. Um, so I saw that as a, fail, a failing of mine or a shortcoming of mine. So I just said, all right, whenever you can, when you can ever at all bear it, just compose, even if it's just studies, right? So this, the way that I've laid out this page is it's nothing crazy, right? It really isn't, but it really just amounts to me before I start the next figure, I just look at the page and I'm like, where would be an interesting spot to plant it? And then I, you can see that I crop, right? Like I'm not drawing the whole figure. I'm doing some bigger, I'm doing some smaller. This one is thighs up. This one is really just a portrait. This one, I'm just looking for those different scales and I'm composing with variety. Um, and it's not not anything crazy, right? It, it, I'm, I'm, I'm not looking for any hard answers or anything like that. None of them are out there. But like I said, it's just taking a pause, a brief pause to say where would be an interesting spot to put this. And then letting that over time, a very long time, reveal to me what are my opinions about that? What are my opinions about what is an interesting spot to put this or not? And it's worked, you know, I'm, I still have a really long way to go with that. I am not a natural composer. I am a natural, if I'm a natural at anything in drawing, it's single object like form refinement. That's what I uh, most naturally incline towards. I am not a natural constant composer and arranger of elements into a holistic whole. That is something I've had to fight for, and I'm really not that great at, and um, I'm trying to get better at it. So uh, I do feel it's helped me improve to, even in studies like this, just turn that part of my brain on a little bit and get it in there. All right, uh, that's it for this page just about. I think after I finished recording, I took that shield that's all the way in the bottom right, that right now is a big white space. And again, like I said, compositionally, it felt too empty. So I wound up hatching that down and putting a shadow on the inside of that shield 
little bit on the figure behind that one, uh, added a bit of his costume in there as well. And again, those are just compositional concerns, but besides that, everything that you're seeing here is how I left this page. So thank you for joining me. Uh, thanks for listening to my weird thoughts and thank you for drawing today. Uh, I really do appreciate that you actually sat down and did some drawing. Um, oh, you didn't know you were supposed to be drawing? You gotta draw while you watch these. Don't just listen to me. Why would you do that? That's nothing. That's not doing anything. Draw.